my pleasure to introduce Ignacio. Uh, he did his PhD split between Chile and Germany, then moved to Max Planck. And now he's uh, doing a postdoc in, in Amsterdam University. Today he's going to talk about quantum field theory and relativistic stars. So, all yours. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you very much for, uh, for coming. Um, actually, I live in the Netherlands, in Amsterdam, and it's always wind and rain over there. So I thought, okay, I'm going to Lisbon, it's going to be nice. And so, the moment I exit the building of the hotel, all hell broke loose. Uh, so I'm completely wet. Um, but anyways, uh, yeah, so this is going to be a, a, obviously a Blackboard talk. I decided to do this because uh, I wanted it hopefully to be more of a discussion rather than a just me vomiting stuff on a PDF. Um, and actually, this is very much work in progress. Uh, I have to say that. Um, so I would be very happy to have uh, feedback on this. Uh, so this is actually an honest question, okay? Um, so the topic of, uh, of today is that I want to uh, point out a few features of quantum field theory that I think uh, we need in order to understand a very dense uh, relativistic objects in general. Um, okay, so the, the plan of the talk is that first I'm gonna review some very basic features about quantum field theory of flat space. And by the way, I know that, uh, or I think that this is a mostly GR uh, oriented uh, audience. Um, now some of the things I'm gonna review here, I know they're very basic and many people know about this, but uh, please don't feel insulted. I just want to, uh, that we're all on the same page. Um, so this means something about essentially the property about QCD. Very well known, but it's important to review. Then uh, in the second part, I'm going to um, switch to the more gravitational part. So review something about TOV equations, which is the main interest uh, for today. And last, I'm going to uh, go to quantum field theory now in curve space um, and see what properties, I mean, what things here are not contained here, and I think we need to use them in order to explain uh, nature. Uh, okay, so the first point, um, what do I mean by quantum field theory in, in flat space? So of course, you know, the nature we have, uh, you know, electromagnetism, that's QD. We have the weak force, and we have the strong force, uh, QCD. And I want to start by pointing out a very important property about the strong force. So, so QCD is basically uh, you know, the theory of quarks and gluons, quarks interacting with gluons. And the thing that eventually uh, led to the Nobel Prize in uh, 2004 was the discovery of asymptotic freedom of QCD. So that means that. Um, if you, one way of explaining this uh, historically is that if you consider uh, the QCD theory um, at different energy scales, theory behaves very differently at low energies and at high energies. So at low energies, um, and I'm not going to be precise here what low and high means, but the, obviously you can make this precise. So at low energies, QCD, uh, <laughs> Has its confining phase. What does that mean? Well, it means that quarks are not free. They are bounded. They form bound states interacting via gluons, right? In fact, I was happily surprised to see that in that uh, poster on the back, uh, you see the, the example I was going to give was precisely the, the proton, right? The proton is nothing but an up, up, down combination of quarks. And these objects are interacting strongly via gluons, right? Now quarks carry an electric charge. Uh, the up uh, quark has two thirds. So this gives four thirds. The down has minus one third. And they, that gives the plus one charge of the proton. You can combine them in other ways. 
to form the neutron and other uh, particles, right? Um, so we live in this space. Everything in this room, we're here, right? The matter making us is, is completely confined. Um, now, on the other side of the spectrum, in the very high energy part, QCD is has asymptotic freedom. And what that means um, is that at very high energies, the, the quarks decouple from the gluons and the gluons decouple from themselves. So there's nothing is interacting and all particles are free. So you have at very high energies, you have you know, free quarks, um, free quarks, and then you have gluons going around, but they don't, they don't see each other. Um, the technical way of saying that is that the QCD, um, the, put, like the beta function is negative for the xbox right? around a UV fixed point. So, um, or in other words, the Feynman diagrams that you would uh, that you would use here that say connect the quark, interacting, you know, emitting the gluon. So these are proportional to a constant G, the coupling constant of QCD. And that G, the thing that, that couples the quarks to the gluons and also the gluons to themselves, right? because gluons, gluons are different than light, right? Light doesn't interact with itself. The coupling between photons is zero, but the gluons do interact with themselves. And that, uh, Interaction is proportional to the strength of the coupling of the QCD coupling. And that coupling G goes to zero at high energies. Okay, that's that's the statement of asymptotic freedom. Um, so okay, so that means that at uh, okay, so now let me fix uh, some notation. I'm always going to talk about. Uh, I'm going to focus on, per on a perfect fluid. So the stress energy tensor of the theory, sorry, T mu nu is going to look like the final flow of E. So the statement is that um, as rho goes to infinity, and again, this doesn't mean technically infinity, but it just becomes much larger than other scales. Um, what we're left with is three um, three quarks plus the free um, gluons, okay? Um, the reason I'm talking about this is because eventually to solve the Einstein equations, you need to, to provide some information about the matter. And in particular, you need to give an equation of state. Um, and normally that's a very hard thing to do, but the high energies, this simplifies tremendously. So, um, Notice, by the way, the QED. So, if I were to I'm allowed to erase this here, so now think about electrons, say, interacting with light. Q, QED does exactly the opposite. Okay, it is weakly coupled here. So this is the region where we can do perturbation theory. That's the alpha equals one over one. 137, right? That's a small number. And at high energies, it becomes strongly coupled. And that's a big problem, right? Especially to the Landau pole and a bit of that. Um, but that's a problem because a theory that is strongly coupled, we don't know how to treat that. We don't know what the equation of state, we cannot do calculations. Right? That's why it's hard to look at the low energy spectrum of QCD and we have to use lattice QCD and so on, right? So the situation, the ideal situation, uh, or, or this situation simplifies. Um, sorry. Uh, no, this is correct. Um, so just notice that these two theories are sort of reversed. Right. Um, okay. So that's just a very general uh, property of uh, quantum field theory uh, of the standard model. And then if we're going to talk about the idea of you know, very 
dense. By that I mean row going to infinity. And I'll be more, I'll explain this more later. So very dense stars. There's a beautiful paper by Collins and Perry from five, where they ask a very simple question. Uh, so in nature, we have, again, these three forces. We have QED, uh, electromagnetism, the weak and the strong force. And they just simply ask, if you had a very compact or a very dense star, when rho goes to infinity, what is the composition of the, of the matter inside? Is there some sort of simplification? Um, and the answer is yes. So in principle, you see here, we could have quarks. We could have leptons, oops, like electrons, muons, tau, and so on. And a priori, there's, or we don't have any way of, of telling, uh, you know, what is the ratio of the particle occupation number here. But it turns out that they figured out that uh, there is a very big simplification at high end. So how does this work? Well, the weak force, and that's actually one of the other Feynman, di Feynman diagrams that, that appear over there. It's the first one on the bottom left. It tells you that the few, Consider the three lightest quarks, uh, the up, the down, say, and the strange. Um, but it doesn't really matter. You can consider all flavors. Uh, the weak interaction, <laughs> what do they do? They transform quarks from one flavor to another. So you have a more massive one, like say the, the, the down. This one can become an up quark plus uh, a leptron, let's say the electron, plus the electron. The same can happen with the strange. This guy can decay into this, plus an electron, plus anything. Um, so what they were asking is, well, there's a sort of chemistry game here, because these flavors are transforming into these ones, and these ones into these ones. So, they ask in equilibrium, um, can we tell us when we say something about the ratio between the number of quarks and the number of leptons? And you see, that's, that's going to be an important thing because we need to know if at high energies, if we have leptons, if there are electrons going around, that's a big problem because at high energies, this becomes strongly coupled. That means we cannot do, do anything or we have to do an event. Um, so what they proved is that if you consider equilibrium, what does that mean? It means first that um, what's, what astrophysicists call, I guess, beta equilibrium. That means that there's the same number. So this process is happening the same number of times in either direction. In this one. Okay, that just, I guess, means that sort of the star is not becoming, it's not taking a particular flavor, right? Uh, all flavors are uh, the same ratio. Um, and the second condition is that, and this is very obvious, that this, this object should be electrically neutral. Then you can see how this works. So basically, uh, the electron has charge one, the quarks have charge two thirds or minus one third or something like this, fractional charges. And you just need to add up all these charges of all particles present. And that gives you a constraint because that thing has to be zero. This gives you another constraint. It's like you need to equalize the chemical potentials. It's like chemistry. And that gives you enough constraints to fully solve the problem. And the answer is that the number, so, the number of quarks the up is equal to the number of uh, down is equal to the number of strange. The number of electrons is equal to zero. This is not at all obvious. I was very surprised when I saw, I mean, this is a super old paper and it's very well known, but I, I just didn't know about this. And of course, there's also the number of piles and, and, and muons and so on. So that, tells you that 
due to because of asymptotic freedom, you use that in this calculation, of course. Uh, because QCD becomes free, then uh, under these conditions, you can prove that QED is not relevant for this process. If it were, we would it would be very unfortunate because we couldn't really do any analytic computation. So the only thing that survives is QCD. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. So is it relevant the fact that QED is going to start up in that computation? For those uh, for completing that? I don't know. No, no, it's not. It's not. It's not. Yeah. Or at least I don't see how it enters the, the, the argument, but, but maybe I should check, check that out. Um, so, the beauty of the situation is why is that? The or what? Uh, what? Sorry. Uh, I didn't see the argument put in this way. I I don't know if you can rephrase this as a minimization problem. I, I'm not sure. Um, so how do you do this in practice? It's very, very simple. So beta equilibrium means you have. No, no, you... I understand that. Oh, okay. Okay. I don't. Physically, you have to have an explanation. I wish I, I had it. So it's a minimum of n. Well, I can say. So I impose that, and that's the. Yeah, it's not too many. Okay. So it should be a physical Okay. I would definitely like to understand this better. So that's a good point. Um, so, yeah. I think what would also ask that uh, the, the high energy regime of QCD is yeah. the same as the high energy regime of QED. So maybe QCD becomes asymptotically free at much higher energy than QED becomes. Non right. That's a very good point. Um, I am throwing that under the rug because those are details about the scales, exactly which it happens that it's important to to figure out eventually. Yeah, yeah. And also that's related to the time scale of the instabilities of the of the uh, oscillations. So so that's actually relevant. Um, okay. So basically, you see, we have QCD, QCD at high energy becomes satisfies this uh, sorry we have this situation in high energies and then the only remaining parameters right so we have three uh three fermions plus three bosons right these are the quarks ones now the last thing i think of doing is saying well there's essentially one last parameter in the problem which is the temperature so now I'm going to do what we always do for the generate stars. Yeah. In relation to my question, for that target, do you need gravitation or? No, 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 no. I will need. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. I don't even. I don't. This has. Yeah, this this is a, this is a flat space argument. But I thought the third was about nuclear stars. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that. But then the question was. I think that I guess the motivation for the paper was well, what is the equation of state that we should use? But that's a flat space computation. I want to add on the curve, uh, quantum field theory and curve space time effect later. Um, so now I take the limit when the temperature goes to zero, right? That's what you do uh, normally with the generate stars. Of course, it's not technically zero, but just much smaller than the Fermi level. Um, and then we have three fermions and three bosons. What do uh, fermions do? Well, these two behave very differently. Fermions degenerate, right? They form the Fermi level, and the free bosons condense, right? And because we're taking the temperature to zero, we can figure out these guys. Um, they all go to the ground state. Um, so basically, in this situation, we are left with a degenerate gas of free fermions. So we're back 
from the good old free ceramic gas theory at zero temperature. But this is, I find this quite remarkable because we didn't get this for free. I mean, you used a very exotic property of QCD, of non abelian gauge theories, to get here. Um, and the point is, a first point here is that this is the correct equation of state. This gives you the equation of state. At least in the regime when rho becomes very, very large. How large then we would need to discuss. Um, Sorry, can I just yeah. You say that you do not have the reference? Yes. So can you get the, these equations or generally in both directions without it? Um, that is a very good question. Okay. Okay. Anyway, I can't think about it. That's a very good point. Uh, <laughs> uh, I know this is correct, but, but okay, now okay. that you said, okay, okay but, but, but I want to clarify that later. Um, so, okay, so this should be the equation of state. Okay, so that was the first part. Um, so, so for the second part, I said, okay, so now we're gonna look at the gravity part of the story, right? So to be concrete, I take a static, you know, static square asymmetric problem, uh, the usual thing, you know, you can just kind of write this with two functions. Um, say like this, that's the sphere, or just like plugging on four dimensions. Um, so here, the exercise is just to solve Einstein equations. You need to pose conservation stress tensor, and you need an equation of state. And the equation of state is the free Fermi mass, right? But when you think about this problem, you realize, oh, but dude, this thing was solved in 1939, right? This is the Oppenheimer fall right? So. Oppenheimer had two papers, two, his two last papers was 1939, one with Snyder on the gravitational collapse, and this was the other one, where they introduced the TOB equation and so on. Um, so what was the result uh, of that remarkable paper? Um, I think there were two main uh, messages. So they simply uh, solved the Einstein equations for the symmetries that we just said. You put this perfect fluid, you use the equation state of uh, Gas. And what do you get? Um, so I think everything is represented in this very important. So you do this, they did this numerically. So you start from, uh, you fix a central pressure, uh, sorry, it uh, doesn't matter, central density. You integrate by layers outwards until you find the surface. Well, the surface is defined at the point where the pressure, you know, this is RV. The pressure at RV vanishes. With that surface, with that radius, you then calculate the mass by just integrating from zero to the surface. You go right? So you fix the central density that gives you radius and a mass, and you keep on doing that. So what they found was that if you now plot the uh, result, which is so the mass um, as a function of rho. Um, so by the way, I think the answer is that there are electrons inside, okay, but the okay. but the average number like is zero because uh, they're disappearing all the time. So in the end, but it ain't. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> what they found, if you plot the mass versus the, and I know many there are many experts in the room here. As a function of the central density, we get this beautiful curve 
that does something like this. Right, so features of this uh, thing, number one, and most important, there's a maximum value of the max here, right? That's the TOV limit. And it was, you know, originally it was estimated around one solar mass. How do you get that particular number? Well, that's because they use at the mass of the fermion, they use the mass of the neutron. Think about neutron stars. So that you need to put plug in that number. And that fixes this number over here. Similar to what Chandrasekhar had done a decade ago uh, before, uh, but this is the GI. Um, that was the first important uh, lesson. The second one was that um, it's related to the stability of this problem. So they figure in a way that they use some sort of thermodynamic arguments. Uh, they show that this branch, all of these are exact solutions to the Einstein equations. But this branch of solutions is stable and this one is unstable. And you know the thing that separates them is the maximum. Uh, I guess that this is the main reason why we believe in black holes. I think so. so yes. Yeah, because what we, I think I might be wrong, but in practice, what we do is that say we detect a gravitational wave, and the mass happens to be ten times the solar mass. So we say, okay, that number is over here. It doesn't intersect with this line, so it can't be a neutron star because we have no other candidate. So be it. But it could also just explode. Of course. Of course. Of course. Of course. Yeah. I'm not saying that the endpoint of this branch is a black hole. It's the thing about uh, candidates. Uh, anyways, um, the maximum separates these two branches. And how do you prove this? Or why is the maximum separating these two? Well, there are different ways of examining this problem, right? You need to study perturbations of all kinds, gravitational perturbations, fluid perturbations, and so on. Um, so now one way of doing that uh, is that you can, for example, uh, just being very concrete, something that I've been doing for a while. So you can look at the radio oscillations. These are easier because there's more symmetry, right? So it's easier to solve. And you can transform the, you know, these equations, right? So the perturbed Einstein equations, you linearize the system, and you can write this thing ultimately as a sort of, um, you know, if we now call the displacement, you know, whatever x, um, you can write this as some differential operator x equals omega squared x. Right? You bring this into a thermal wheel problem with some particular boundary conditions. Um, and then the question, of course, is to find the step, the eigenvalues of this operator. Um, so there's a criterion. Um, which tells you that um, if you do that, then if you find a point along this curve where the derivative of this curve here vanishes, so this guy is, and I know, I know there are experts in the room, so sorry if I, anyways. Um, then there exists some, so sorry, or some, so there is one eigenfunction whose eigenvalue is going to zero. It doesn't tell you which one. Then, it, then, then you have to keep digging to figure out which one it is. Um, and that explains, um, or actually, I should say, Omega square goes to zero. That's the correct statement. So that means that, so what happens here? Here, the entire spectrum is uh, positive. So all the eigenvalues, you can just check by yourself. All the eigenvalues here are positive. Uh, so their squares are positive. 
but here the lowest mode becomes unstable. Let's call it omega zero. This guy square becomes negative. And then there's a growing mode, right? Because these things oscillate as e to the so this wave over here, this guy is oscillating as e to the minus i of t. This guy grabs imaginary particle signs and then this thing uh, grows exponentially. So this criterion, this guy over here, is another way of restating that. This point over here, where the derivative vanishes, separates the stable from the unstable batch. This is, again, I know it's very well known. Um, and that's the standard story, I guess. Now, notice that this, this, this box over here is sort of 21st century physics. Um, when when these people were doing this computation in the 1930s, they, they didn't know if this, you know, whether the, the free Fermi gas was applicable or not at these densities. They haven't even discovered strong force, I guess. So, but then later on, uh, people realized, well, this is not the correct equation of state at every density, right? Because at intermediate densities, we have confinement and uh, it's not going to work. Um, but something that I feel is not noticed uh, enough is the fact that from this entire curve, we don't know what the, what the right equation of state is to use at any point along this curve. The only thing we do know for sure is this, is that along the tail, the equation of state is a free, is free from us. That's the only thing we know for sure. Uh, so, and I guess we should use it. Um, okay, so uh, there's something I want to notice about uh, sort of the common lore is that precisely, as I said, like what we do know is that when rho becomes very large, then the equation of state is definitely the free fermion one. Uh, so we know that this part of the curve is correct. Um, and then you notice, you see that picture. There's a second thing that Oppenheimer and Falkov noticed, but apparently it was kind of a lost history. It was that there's another interesting point along this curve, which is a point in infinity. Right, because the mass of this thing, this curve asymptotes to some other fixed mass. Let me call that n sub infinity. It's a finite, something finite. Um, and it's related to the to Buffa's theorem, actually. So what I want to just point out is that there's another point where this happens, but it happens only asymptotically. Namely, this derivative is going to zero as rho goes to infinity. So that means that there's another mode that is changing sign at infinity. So this is the ambiguity. Yes. Well, no, no, no. A, sorry, m infinity. M infinity is a number. Yeah. Okay. And that function m is, is this function. Yeah. Let's so this. Let's change our second mode, right? Sorry. Let's change our second mode. Uh, what is? Chandra Chandra second. Second. No. You are not getting the limiting mass. No, no, no. Yeah. So the the, the analog of the Chandra second uh, point of uh, limit is this one. It's the one here. The maximum of this. But uh, rho is that rho is No. No, rho is some value here. It's around the it's around the new predecessor. Chandra second limiting mass. No. Yeah, I don't think it's point max. Oh, maybe I. What is the Chandra second point or maximum mass of the white dwarfing? Yeah, but that does not mean that their density was infinite. No, no, no. No, no, no. Well, no. no, no. oh, I have to discuss that. Yeah, but okay, let's discuss that later. But I think that's not true. That's how Chandra second got that. No, 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 no. That's 
Can I disagree with that? Um, <laughs> the way how he did that is that you, you analyze that you, you look at a variational problem where you define a certain action, you have a kinetic term, you have a potential term, and you find whenever the potential turns around, but there's no local minimum of this function, that's how you find the, the maximum value of the answer. It's the Newtonian analog of what I was saying here. You study the radial modes, and whenever the first unstable mode appears, that's the time to take that. Okay. But, uh, shall I take it from maximum lines? Yes, and that's the way I'm the radius of the star goes to zero, and the electrons are relatively zero. That's for sure. It's no, electron diversity, not neutron. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Let's we change the mass of the neutron for the mass of the electron. But yeah, yeah, yeah. This yeah, is the time of sacred mass. Yes, you can do the same. That's open no, no, of course, but so the only difference between Chandrasekhar's computation and this one is that Chandrasekhar used, he solved the Poisson equation. He used Newtonian gravity, right? He uses the equation of state of fermions. Um, and the result is the maximum value of the mass. That is equivalent to this number over here, but not this. One. This is not a maximum value of the mass. Um, we can discuss it uh, yeah, yeah. further. So, so I have a question. So how do we know that this derivative goes to zero? Oh, you have to check it for yourself. Okay. Yeah. Because I mean when you when you compute this curve, yeah. Um, you actually get oscillations. Very okay, very good point. So why do you get those oscillations? So if you if you're a purist and you just use the free Fermi gas with a fixed mass, whatever it is, the electron, the neutron, top quark, whatever, then you get such a you get this curve. If you change the mass, this just changes to a curve like this. But it always looks like this. In order to get those curves that you see on all references, what people do is that people change the equation of state. So I think the one you're thinking about is the one where you have the white dwarf branch. So you you have something like this. Then you have a maximum. That's a tangent second limit. Something like this. Something like that. Then you have the unstable, let's unstable white dwarf branch. Then this thing turns again, and you have the stable neutron star branch until so you get to this point, which is the QV limit, which is precisely this one. And after that, uh, people just stop plotting, I guess. It, yes, yes. But, but you get these oscillations even if you keep the location of state fixed. This is what you get. It depends on which equations yeah, that you yeah. use. For the Fermi Dirac distribution at zero temperature, this is what you get. But um, so I'm, I'm talking about the non relativistic candidate. Yeah. Um, this is a fixed particle mass, and then yeah. you get oscillations. The asymptotes towards, it's like a damp oscillation towards this. You're energy. thinking about a polytrope. Yeah, yeah. Right? But it's. Um, yes, I, I agree with that. It, it depends exactly on what you mean by that, but I, I agree with what you're saying. Um, this is not what, you're, what I'm doing here. So this thing, I agree that at low energies, this thing can have some other kind of oscillation. This is just an academic example. The reason I'm giving this example is because I'm interested in this part. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, after the maximum mass, I mean, something else, something else might happen. Certainly, sir. Yeah, yeah. The only thing I'm saying is that at infinity, there is a great simplification going on because QCD becomes free, QED goes away because there's no there's no electrons, whatever that means. Uh, you can get them out of the game. Uh, I understood all it. Sorry. I understood. Yeah. What's the explanation? No, no, no. no. Okay. <laughs> Tell me later, please. Um, and then. Uh, and then this 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 thing happens. Um, okay, ten minutes. Or less, a bit less. Okay. Uh, okay. Good. Uh, then I'm going to stop here for the for the second part and let me uh, tell you about the last part. So the the important the only important thing that I want you to remember from the second part is this thing. <laughs> the asymptotically, this is happening. The mass is converging to some number. Okay, but that that does not qualify for this criterion because here we really need that this thing vanishes at a finite value of the 
of the test. And the last point I want to make is how could that happen? Um, so how can I explain this in less than 10 minutes? Um, okay, so last point, I said this was something about quantum field theory in curved space. So the this statement about asymptotic freedom, blah, blah, blah. This thing is a flat space. This is flat space. Everything on that board is flat space physics, right? Now, if we're going to the regime where rho is going to infinity, it means that the curvatures are also drawn without bound, which means we should use quantum field theory in curve space. Now, how does that change this uh, picture? Well, Dirac used to say there's two ways of making progress. One is to unify theory unify ideas coming from different points. And the other one is to find inconsistencies and try to remove them. That's how he found this equation, or at least that's how he told the story. Um, so I want to point out an inconsistency in this picture in everything that I just said, and it's very crucial. And it's simply the fact that let's compare what we get from, so the calculation of the equation of, the equation of state you take the free gas, the free Fermi gas, you do quantum statistical mechanics in flat space, and you get something. And that's the equation state you plug in, right? Uh, but what we should actually do is the quantum field theory of the Dirac field, right? We want to do this thing honestly. So if, um, if you're in flat space, uh, these two things are identical. So it doesn't matter if you're doing quantum field theory or you're doing statistical mechanics. But if you're in curved space, these are not equal. And the correct one for this is fine, this is fine. If this is not okay, this is the correct one. Quantum field theory is the real thing. Forget about how do you notice this? There's a very easy way of seeing this. I get to the more uh, technical uh, term, but I'm just going to give you uh, the, the result, which is that uh, this is related to, uh, okay, I'm just going to say consider the trace of the energy moment of test. The way how you can see this difference is that the trace of the energy momentum tensors here with this calculation coincides with this one. But if you do it here in curved space, it does not coincide with this one. Okay, and that is comes directly from something called the trace anomaly. This is a sacred property of quantum field theory. This is, there's no way we can change this. And it's simply the statement that I'm just gonna give you the result. Um, but it, how I see it, at least the topic of anomalies in quantum field theory in general, is probably, I guess, one of the most important results in sort of late 20th century uh, physics because it relates to topology to, to particle physics. But what is the, 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 the trace on statement? Is that the correct thing to plug into the Einstein equations or to use in physics for the energy momentum tensor, let's say for its trace. So if you do the, the full calculation, the full quantum field theory calculation, that thing is going to give you one contribution that comes from the step that is identical to the statistical mechanics computation, but there's a correction. That correction, let me call it like this. This is quantum field theory in first space time. That correction takes this form. Um, and then I'm almost done. So uh, these two numbers, C and A, and just two real numbers, positive real numbers that we understand right 
very well. These are the simple charges. You don't know what this is. Just forget about it. These are some fixed numbers. Give me the Lagrangian. You fix these numbers. And uh, sorry, the square here. B, uh, this this thing is just the biotensor, and E is the Gauss boson density of four dimensions. Right, the thing that you integrate or the manifold that gives you the polar characteristics. Okay, it depends on the curvature. It's, it's quadratic in the curvature. So this E. It's like Riemann squared minus four Ricci squared plus R squared. Okay, and this again, this is this is a topological result. There's, there's nothing you can argue about this. This is sacred in quantum field theory. Um, so I hope you see my point that the inconsistency is that when we solve the theory equations and we draw that plot we did before, we only use this term. At low energies, that's fine because this operator, so this trace, the anomalous trace, depends only on the curvatures. So if the curvatures are low, this term is not very relevant. But very importantly, you see that the, this term, actually both these terms, these scale quadratically with the curvatures. Some small three factors, it's fine, but they scale as the curvature square. Whereas the statistical mechanics term, you just plug it into the Anson equation, this depends on the Ricci scalar, right? So it scales linearly with, with the curvatures. So you have a situation where you have these terms that are the dominating effect at low curvature and low energies. And then there's another term that you cannot get rid of. This, this is absolutely sacred. I cannot emphasize that enough. Um, it, but that term, which is very small at low energies, becomes a dominating term at high energies. So the question I'm trying to answer is, uh, and this is the last thing I draw, I promise. Um, the question is, if you could do the computation, and Valentin knows a lot about these things, he'll probably tell you that these are very extremely complicated computations. But if we could, if we could compute, so the thing, question is sort of, I'm just gonna write it like this very uh, schematically. So the anomalous contributions, these new terms, if we could compute that, people have been trying to compute this for 50 years. We've gone, we've gotten kind of nowhere, unfortunately. Um, it's extremely hard because this thing is played with UV infinities and so on. It's, but if you could do this, then my question is, if you take these effects into account, you see the mass, the total mass, is gonna receive two contributions because this thing is the integral of uh, R squared times T zero zero, the, the step mech, the usual, plus the anomalous. Normally, we just thought we'd just use the first term. But the first term gives rise to the Oppenheimer fault curve, right? It's like this. So, my question is if you now include this contribution over here, that you know that it's diverging at high, at high energies and it's diverging quadratically faster than the original term, then what does this curve do? Because I'm pretty sure this is conjecture. This is from, I'm going to say now is pure speculation. What I guess this curve is going to do is to curve either like this up or down. And I put an asymptote here because, well, forget about this. It's just going to curve either up or down. And it has to do, I don't think it will oscillate like that. It doesn't make, really make any sense. So there's no reason to expect that. The only thing you need to figure out is what is the sign in front of this guy. That's very hard computation, but it either goes up and grows very fast or it goes down. Either way, there's something interesting, I think. If it goes up, then there's a possibility, and this is related to what you were saying before. There's a possibility that this branch is stable now. It's not guaranteed. You need to look at the details. If it goes down, 
then these solutions are much more unstable than you thought they were. So the time scale of the instability is much different than you would have naively guessed. So I don't know the answer. I don't even know if this is true. Um, I hope it will. I don't hope anything, but uh, uh, I just think it's a very interesting problem that involves simple physics or physics simplifies. And either way, I think it's going to be an interesting result. Uh, that's it. Thank you. So thank you very much, Ignacio. We still have five minutes for questions. If some, if that's some. I yeah. am a generally blasphemy, so I want to ask something about what is secret for you. Can you not send it to zero for scale invariant units? No, no, no. That's how it was discovered. So that's what that's why this is a scale invariant prescription for regularization. Yeah. No, that's how that's precisely how this effect was discovered. In fact, this thing is. I call it a trace anomaly, but it's actually people call it the conformal anomaly, yeah. which means, but that, what does that mean? It means that for a CFT, for a classical CFT, right, H5 is zero. Yeah, but I'm not saying CFT because I think it was oh. like last year or a couple of years ago, they were looking into this. I are not talking found about that all the subgroups of CFT violate this except for scale symmetry. I remember this, but I might be wrong. So, That's how right. would you, st what, what is the correct statement? Is that CFT is uh, it gets anomalous at some point because uh, you call it yeah. curve space time. Yeah. The only subgroup of all the conformal group is scale symmetry that you can provide a scale, uh, scale invariant regularization that doesn't show up anomalies. But I might be wrong. I mean, we can. And what, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, paper, okay, so. okay. I think I had heard that some time ago. Yeah, okay. I would like to understand that better. More questions? Valentin, raise hands first. So is there some simple example in which we can get some information about this sign? Oh, yeah, there is. Um, and it's actually contained in the original paper of an Oppenheimer photo, and also in Tolman's paper of the same year, same month. Um, which is that in both papers, they noticed that this part was interesting, and then they they find what you can think of as the solution at infinity. It's, the metric is there in the papers, right? They, they, uh, so you can find sort of the metric when rho central on infinity. Of course, that metric is singular. Right? That's a, but it only has a singularity of the origin. Everywhere else, it's completely fine. You have a, there is an explicit metric in this credit system. So you can take that metric, and because it's so simple and analytic, you can do this computation exactly, because you know the value of tensor. Or you know the full Einstein tensor. So there, you have the result. You don't have this. You have something less. You have this guy, you know, this, this guy exactly. And you can see how this thing scales. In fact, you can see that it scales in a very interesting way. Um, I'll tell you more of the details later, but it's it suggests very strongly, I think, but there, I don't have any proof um, that indeed that this curve diverges. Uh, but then there's a whole question of convergence of the differential equation given by space and so on. So um, I don't know any example of where you could do this. Anyone knows it then? Yeah. Yeah. Any any questions why or why you think it should diverge and why and not just change the Right. Okay. Then, then I'm gonna then I'm gonna make precise what I just said. Um, so, for this metric that I just mentioned, which is sort of the solution at infinity, you can you can calculate explicitly. Um, yeah, because it could also be that those contributions they just give you a 
a small contribution that also goes to zero, right? It could well be. Um, why do I think it's likely that that's not the case? Because I don't have this term, but I know the full trace. And what you and, and you notice the following thing that this the classical, so the, the stat mech result, this thing scales as one over r squared close to the origin. That's the as I said, this is a singular solution at the origin. That's fine, it diverges there. So fine. now I compute the anomalous part. I don't have the components, but I compute, sorry. I compute the trace, okay? This thing diverges as one over r to the four, okay? So this thing over here contains, you know, one of its terms is T00. So I think it's sort of reasonable to assume, I don't know the sign, but the, that there is a term here that goes as one over r to the four. Speculation again. But if that is so, then remember that what you're integrating here, you're integrating this thing against r squared, that into diverges. So it's a uh, hocus pocus, but yeah. So, sorry, could you say that again? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I don't know. Might be. Uh, it depends on exactly what's going on because uh, it's not enough. I that this is a crucial point. It's not enough that the curve turns up again. Uh, what you need to check, all that tells you is that there was another point where, an, where some eigenvalue went to zero. But what you need to prove is that the eigenvalue that vanished here was the same eigenvalue that vanished here. So that in the spectrum, like all eigenvalues are above zero. If that is true, then what you're saying is true. But it could also be that what happened is that here, the lowest line mode became unstable and here the next mode became unstable. So this branch, it looks like it's stable, but it's actually not, it's more unstable than this one. But in order to answer this, you need to have more fine grained information about what the radius is doing and what the it's contraction or expansion. Uh, I'm wondering, is there any difference in that case of blue light by the fact that we didn't observe uh, this kind of conformity? I don't know what we observe actually. I mean, we see something, there's no light coming from it, it's massive. And we say it's a black hole, but, so but the only know. reason is because we believe in this curve. So, yeah, last question. It's exactly the analog of the Buchwald limit for this equation to stay. That's the correct intuition. Hey, it's going to be one minute. <laughs> so, so I have a question about this um, price anom uh, anomaly. Yeah. Um, so you said you have these uh, average just squared terms. Yeah. Um, from that come from the energy momentum. Yeah. Um, so for me, it seems then that the energy momentum tensor must somehow depend on second derivative of the metric. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. So. But usually the meta models we use um, there they don't depend on yeah. second derivatives. Yeah. So how do the second derivatives and they do? So normally the reason why I think why they're normally not second order is, is because we use flat space information to get an equation to stay. As soon as you go to curve space time, you realize this. Now, like exactly what the origin of this, like the physical origin of, of this is, then you have to ask about it. Yeah, because it's something, it's, it's similar to the Schringer effect, uh, to the Schringer effect in QED. Like if you put a very strong electric or magnetic field, you start, you 
in Hawking's pictorial view, there are these virtual particles, right? And if you put a strong magnetic field, they just get separate and they become real and they create voltages and currents and so on. And here it's a similar thing. You can, it's sort of a vacuum polarization effect. It's similar to the Hawking effect and so on. This is actually using the trace anomaly is one way how you can derive the Hawking effect. Yeah. Well, unfortunately we run out of time, but please feel free to- Thank you. If you enjoyed the video, like, and subscribe.